Hello, AP Calculus AB, and welcome back from our big reveal, the fundamental theorem of calculus, emphasis on the fun. Um, today is actually almost nothing new. Um, however, we're going to practice the fundamental theorem of calculus a bunch. We're going to look at some common mistakes, and we're going to revisit U substitution and see how that works for definite integrals, because if you remember before, we used U substitution to simplify indefinite integrals. However, this opener can can be done in any number of ways. Um, so let's see what you guys can come up with. Your goal is to both um, apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, and um, in order to do that, of course, you will need to use your antiderivative rules. So good luck on this. Feel free to use the end of day 73 to help you out, and we'll come back together once you've tried all three. Ready, set, good luck, go. Okay. Um, there are a couple different ways to do these, and I'm going to try to uh, maybe show you different methods that you hadn't considered before. Um, as a reminder, though, if you um, need help, right, the first step is you need to, um, let's say, determine... We didn't write these rules last class. I don't think I've ever written them before, but it's not going to hurt. We're going to determine the antiderivative, and then we're going to, and we'll call that f of x, and then we're going to evaluate f of b minus f of a, right? And that's if we're given from a to b of f of x dx. That's it, two steps. So the first thing we need to do is essentially ignore these endpoints and just find the antiderivative. Um, let's maybe keep that two in there for now, and you could factor it out front if you would like, if that makes you happier. Um, but I'm going to use those square brackets. It's just my preferred notation, nothing changing here. Antiderivative, we need to add one to the power, make it x cubed, but we'll cancel that out. Well, this needs to become two-thirds. Now, you could substitute in 6 and 3 and subtract them right away, and that's fine. You'll get the right answer. Uh, but then you're going to have to use 2 thirds twice. So I would actually, before going through that fundamental theorem, I would factor out the 2 thirds first, just to make your life a little bit easier, and then apply the fundamental theorem, which, of course, says substitute in the upper limit first, and then the lower limit, subtract, and see how we did. Okay, um, simplifying, never a bad thing. 6 times 6 is 36, times another is going to be 216. We all know our cube's up to 10, right? It's okay if you don't. Um, and then we're going to distribute that 2 thirds, except I'm just going to distribute a third from 2 first, because um, 3 goes into 21 nicely and 6 nicely, and 3 goes into 27 nicely. And then, just do some math here, right? So we have 72 minus 9, which is going to be 63. And if you double 63, it looks like it's going to be 126. Great. A couple little tricks and shortcuts in there as you evaluate, but it's all good mental math practice. All right. Part B. Um, with Part B, I probably would not do the antiderivative that way. Kind of weird things happen when there's uh, a 3x in here um, because, and I'm going to erase this, so be ready. You might be tempted to say, ooh, that's natural log of 3x, and you're not wrong. But the derivative, if you wanted to check it, would become 1 over 3x times an extra 3, and then those cancel. And of course, you might say, well, couldn't you put an extra one-third out front? And you could, and you'd get there, but there's really no point, I think, because we can probably rewrite this integral first, and we'll do it up above, and we can say, why not we just do the antiderivative of, um, from 1 to 2 of 1 over x dx. And that way, you don't even have to worry about the extra constant. It was just multiplying, right? Hopefully, we see if we multiply those two together, um, we get the same answer we started with. So as we go through... Uh, we do our antiderivative. We do need to remember that absolute value. It is incorrect without the absolute value. And then we substitute. Now, once you start substituting, you could leave the absolute value around the 2, but you could also skip that step, and you could say, well, I know the absolute value of 2 is 2. And so it's really up to you whether you leave it as with absolute value or not, nothing bad. Um, you might hear some fun squeaking in the background. My dog always decides that it's the perfect time to squeak when we're recording. So um, he's sad and paying this video more attention than him, but that's okay. Um, and can you simplify this too much further? Not really. We can show you a couple tricks, though. Um, we should probably remember that any log of 1, whether it's natural log or anything else, is 0. 
So that just leaves one third natural log of two. And then we also might remember that you can even bring in the one third as a power. Isn't that exciting? And you could even rewrite this as the cube root of two if you wanted. I would probably stop here honestly but um, it's never a bad thing to revisit these natural log or and general log rules uh, so we don't forget them because sometimes they do come up all right last but not least oof we're violating one of our cardinal rules here in that we have one function x times another function that also contains x if it was a derivative you need the product rule if it's an antiderivative we don't have a product rule so you need to use some sort of trickery uh, we learned in our antiderivative section that trickery could be something like um, completing the square or long division um, but both of those usually happen when you have a fraction and there's no fraction here uh, so you might be tempted to turn to u substitution and you'd be right. So let's try u substitution. And uh, before those of you who are well versed in u substitution of definite integrals bite my head off, I am purposely doing this problem somewhat incorrectly. Don't let it worry you. It's okay. We'll address it in a second. So let's just pretend for a second that these are not here. All right, it's 0 and 1. And we are just going to work the indefinite integral of x times x squared plus 1 cubed. And the reason I'm doing this is because u substitution has a weird little caveat idiosyncrasy uh, trick if you want uh, with definite integrals. So let's ignore the endpoints for now and just remember how u substitution works. So we'll let u equal the more complicated piece. We don't want to include the cube though because then this power would be two larger than the power here. We usually want the u to be one larger than um, a function with another power. Um, and then du is 2x, right? Um, the differential is the derivative of this, which is 2x times dx at the end. We might realize that x dx is here, but there's an extra 2, so I would divide that over and we end up here. All right, so this gives us u cubed, did not like that integral, um, and then x dx is replaced with 1 half du. All right, um, so then I think we could probably factor out the 1 half before we even do the antiderivative, and then end up with 1 half, let's see, antiderivative is u to the fourth, 1 fourth in front, plus c, and then we probably remember our last step, and I'll clean up the 1 half times 1 fourth, which is 1 eighth, replacing u with what it was originally equal to, which is, of course, x squared plus 1. And we've done a very nice job here with our indefinite integral. Um, in fact, I should probably box this uh, maybe in blue to show that this was kind of a side problem here. Um, but we do need to actually do the definite integral. But the nice part is everything I did in black and blue here has to do with the antiderivative part. That's like our step one up here, yeah? Step two is just evaluate. So let's go ahead and evaluate. To do that, I'm just going to kind of shortcut this. We were going from 0 to 1 of x times x squared plus 1 cubed dx. And we found the antiderivative 1 eighth x squared plus 1 to the fourth from 0 to 1, right? From here to here, that is a true statement. In fact, on a free response question, if you go from here to here, that is absolutely full credit. All of this stuff in the middle is kind of extra. You're expected to know how to do it at this point, and you really don't have to show that work. Um, if you show the work, that's fine, but on a problem like this, it probably would not be graded. Okay, so let's go a step further. I'm going to factor out the 1 eighth here. Um, and then start substituting in. If we substitute in 1, we get 1 plus 1, which is 2 to the 4th, minus substitute in 0. 0 plus 1 is 1 to the 4th. Continuing through, uh, 2 to the 4th, 2, 4, 8, 16, minus 1 is 15. And so we end up with 15 eighths. I think every year my students ask, how come you're using square brackets instead of parentheses? Do I need to keep using square brackets? And the answer is no. Once you get past here, you probably should use regular parentheses. It doesn't really matter one way or another, though. And since I started writing square ones, I just continue it out. Everyone will know what you mean, though. So there we go. Three problems, varying difficulties, all with little bits and tips and tricks scattered throughout. And that's really kind of the first part of today. Now, um, there is a more efficient way 
to do this last problem. And u substitution has a really neat little trick, a little subtlety here uh, that's going to make your life uh, quite a bit easier. Not quite a bit. And this problem was what, maybe like seven steps, and we can reduce it down to like five steps if you'd like. Um, and so we're going to talk through that, and then you'll try a few examples. So um, realistically, when no one ever writes this for their integral, but this is part C again, um, the integral technically should say from x equals 0 to x equals 1, letting you know that they're along the x-axis. And this is a function of x. Everything in here in ter is in terms of x. Right? Now we don't do that because it's just assumed that it matches. Um, but the problem is when you do u substitution, and we talked about this before, um, Technically, our integral gets two different variables, right? Let's look at the u substitution process one more time here, right? We said we're going to let u equal x squared plus 1. It's going to take care of this. And then you'll remember, I think, that 1 half du was equal to 2x, um, was equal, not to 2x, was equal to x dx, right? And that took care of this piece over here. Um, but it would actually not be a correct statement to say that this from 0 to 1, and then we replaced this piece with u, and the other piece with 1 half du, and then, of course, you could factor out the 1 half to get over here, right? That's where that piece came from. Both of these statements are incorrect, and in fact, they would lose you points if you showed that sort of work on a free response. Why are they incorrect? Well, it's because whenever you do a u substitution, you need to make sure that every value or every variable is replaced with your u substitution and we haven't done that because technically and this is a, a nice graphing comparison here what we're saying and I can even show you on Desmos is that the area under the original graph and I don't know what this graph is which is why I'm pulling up Desmos the area under the original graph of x times x squared plus 1 cubed let's take a peek at that really quickly if you want to follow along on your Desmos, you can, or you can just take a peek. So we have x times x squared plus 1 cubed. Here's this graph, and we're just going to restrict the graph. We're just going to look from 0 to 1. You restrict a graph using these curly braces here. Um, and so there is that graph, right? So the area is this guy kind of right here, kind of this triangular little piece. We're saying that that area from 0 to 1 is equal to the area of this graph from 0 to 1. But these are still x values. And if we looked at that, let's look at the graph of 1 half u cubed. And I wonder if they'll, I bet it'll even let me do that. 1 half u cubed. Yeah, it even lets me use u as a variable. It's just an independent variable. And if we look at this graph from 0 less than or equal to u, which is less than or equal to 1, I mean, look at those two. Is this area right here the same as this giant red area over here? Absolutely not. It's th this one is way smaller. So there's no way that this integral here is going to give us the answer to that integral over here. And that's because we haven't changed the interval along the axis. This interval up above from 0 to 1 is only good along the x-axis where x is this variable. And so if we're doing a correct and proper u substitution, and they're very big about asking this question on multiple choice to make sure you do it, if you leave these in terms of x's, you will get the wrong answer. How do we fix it then? Well, if those are x's and everything else is u, then we probably need to convert the x's into u's. How do we do that? Well, we have an equation that takes an input of x and spits out an output of u, so we should probably find u of 1 for the upper limit is going to be 1 squared plus 1 using our formula here, which is 2. And then also, we have u of 0. So 0 squared plus 1, which is 1. So in actuality, this integral should say, and I'll put the 1 half inside for now just so we can compare the graphs, um, 1 half u cubed du from 1 to 2. And now let's look at those graphs again. So let's say I went from 1 to 2. 
now we have a much better area comparison. So this area definitely goes up to a higher bit, but this is a really small sliver. Versus this area has this whole block at the bottom, which is going to outshine a lot of this area, and then a much bigger triangular piece over here. And so now you might be able to convince yourself that this area, even though they look different, could have the equal area to beneath the blue graph in between the x-axis. And in fact, they are equal if we've done a proper U substitution. Okay, so um, if we finish this off then, okay, we'll factor that one half out front again, and I'm going to need a little bit of space here, did not do well with that. Um, we're going to factor the one half out and then take our antiderivative of u cubed, that's one quarter u to the fourth, right, from one to two. And here's the cool part with u substitution. Remember those couple steps up above where we had to replace this? We don't need to do that anymore because now this area is the same as the original graph and we converted everything, so let's just keep using those. One fourth and one half get factored out and then we substitute in two and substitute in one. And so we finish off, hopefully you can see that this is 15 again with 15 eighths. And I think it's pretty easy to make the argument that this is much less work than having to write all of that. Okay. Now, it's not always less work. Sometimes it's only one fewer steps, and sometimes it's the same amount of work because you do have to do this intermediate step. But key point for now is understanding that with definite integrals, if you use a U substitution, you are required to change the limits. Now, some people ask, well, wait, couldn't we do it like we did up here where you do an indefinite integral? and then you find the answer and then you use the original limits and the answer is yes but the AP exam is sneaky and they're gonna test you on your ability to change those limits through clever multiple choice questions so let's take a look at one example and then you guys are gonna practice a few given the integral below this crazy guy which of the following is equivalent to the above integral using a u substitution and so they don't actually evaluate the integral they show different u substitutions and you need to determine which one is correct and you bet they're going to replace those endpoints as well. Now they were nice here, they gave you the u substitution which is really useful because this is actually a pretty tricky antiderivative to find. So let's see how this works. Um, from 1 to 4 and then I'm going to rewrite this, I've done this a few times now, as e to the square root of x times 1 divided by the square root of x dx. And the reason I'm thinking of that is because I'm pretty comfortable with the derivative of the square root. I know when you do the derivative of the one-half power, it's going to become a negative one-half power, which moves it to the denominator. So I'm gambling on this derivative matching something over here, whereas this u substitution matches something over here. But let's bring some color into it, just so we can see the comparison here. Uh, we'll, I think, let u equal, of course, to the square root of x, which is x to the one-half. At the same time, we're also going to find our differential. And our differential is going to be 1 half x to the negative 1 half of the derivative of our function with x times dx at the end. I am going to quickly rewrite this, though, I think, as 1 over 2 times 1 over the square root of x dx. And you might now notice that these two pieces match. There is an extra one-half, but of course we could multiply both sides by 2 to get 2 du equals 1 over square root of x dx. And now we're in business, so let's take a look. We have the integral, we have e to, I did that in blue, e to the u times 2 du, right? This gets replaced with 2 du. And we can even, I think, go one step further because it looks like they factored out the 2 out of all of those. So we have 2 times the integral of e to the u du. Now doing that, we can actually eliminate a few answers here. We know it's not the 1 half. Uh, we know it's not e to the u without the 2. But the other three all have 2s. What are the only differences? Those limits of integration. Because if we were to do this incorrectly and say this went from 1 to 4, we would get the wrong answer, which they've cleverly put here, because those limits, as written, are still in the form of the original x-axis. We need to convert them to a new axis, our u-axis. And we do that just by evaluating each of them in our u equation. So we can find u of 4, 
which is the square root of 4, which is 2, and then also u of 1, which is the square root of 1, or 1. So how does this work? Well, the upper limit became 2, the lower limit actually stayed 1 here, and now we have our answer. The first part of today is going to focus on u substitution, um, and I'm actually not going to take you through these. I have these answers posted on Teams, um, but however, I would like you guys to try each of them and then check your answers on Teams. Once you're done with those, and I imagine it'll take you about 10 or 15 minutes or so, you'll come back and we'll do the last part of today, which are some common mistakes over tricky problems. So turn to the next two pages, right? One, two pages, six questions. And once you are done with those six and you've found answers for each, or you've found that I've made typos and then answers for each, uh, come back here and we'll move on to the last part. Ready, set, go. All right, hopefully you had some fun with those and you found some success. If you do have any questions or I did make any mistakes, please, please, please uh, touch base either on this channel or by emailing me. Um, and let's get to the last part of today. The last part of today are six problems. I think one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six problems that I designed um, that I think highlight or identify some common misconceptions and mistakes that I've seen students make over the last few years in AP Calculus. So it says check the work for each problem. If it's incorrect, I'm telling you right now, every one of these is incorrect somewhere. Then you need to fix the work in the third column and find the right answer. And then fill in the last column about why you think I gave this to you. Basically, what is the common mistake that I believe that students make? And we're kind of going to go one at a time here. So I would say try one. If you get stuck, then unpause me. If you're doing well, keep working through until you get stuck. And then you can kind of skim through and see how I did it. So first problem, you got this, go. All right, what was the mistake on the first problem? Um, I see a lot of people get stuck in antiderivative rules. So they see this x to the negative first, and they think, oh, I always add 1 to the power. And when I add 1 to the power, then we get x to the 0th. You substitute in 2 and 1. Anything to the 0th is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. But what I think they forget is that there are some weird exceptions to this rule, and that x to the negative first is actually 1 over x. And 1 over x, isn't that the natural log of x? And so we end up with the natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 1, but that's 0. So I think we just finished with the natural log of 2, not 0. Okay. Uh, you could have also seen this if you graph the equation, y equals x to the negative first, or y equals 1 over x. It looks like this in the first quadrant. Here's the third quadrant, um, but it looks like this. Clearly the area from 1 to 2 is not 0. That does not make any sense. So bring some logic in there, and if you made a mistake, keep working on those antiderivative rules, and I'll leave you to fill out this last column. Second problem, go. All right, uh, second problem, you're probably like, well, wait, I know 1 over x, we just did this problem. Okay, exciting. So we took the antiderivative, it's natural log of x, we're great so far, we plugged in those. Does not exist. Why does it not exist? Um, well, that's because uh, if you have the natural log of x, then we need to remember that x uh, must be greater than 0, which means x can't be 0, you can't do any log of 0, and x also cannot be smaller than 0. I don't know why I put negative 1. Um, that's not allowed either. And I'm sure there's a less than with a cross out through it that's not an angle. But either way, those are bad. This is good. And so when we substitute in negatives, we should realize those are bad. And so it does not exist, right? Right? Well, yes, everything I said there is correct. The mistake actually occurs before that. And let's see if we can spot it. Negative e to negative 1, 1 over x dx. Antiderivative is not the natural log of x. It is, in fact, the natural log of the absolute value of x. And if you forget the absolute value, this problem will make no sense at all. And you do need to be very careful with that. What happens? Well, these become positive values, like so. This is still 0. And we also need to remember that the natural log and e undo each other, but they don't just vanish. They leave a 1 behind. Okay. Third one. 
All right, hopefully you gave this a shot, and on the third one, you're looking at this, and you're like, okay, you can't trick me this time. I'm great with natural log. Now I know it has to do with absolute value. Substitute everything in. Oh, we've done everything right. It's natural log of 2. Well, no, sadly it's not. Um, because now, although this looks fine, and this looks fine, and this looks fine, the thing that's really wrong is the actual antiderivative. This is not natural log for an antiderivative, sadly, sadly. Um, natural log only occurs if it's 1 over x to the first power, or if a u substitution results in 1 over x to the first power. Anytime you have another power, things get trickier. If it was 1 over x squared, then we would rewrite that as x to the negative second, and we could do the antiderivative. But this is too complicated to rewrite, unfortunately. This is one we just need to know, don't we? Right? x squared plus 1 dx. Isn't this our inverse tangent? Uh-oh. And now we're panicking because we realize we don't know too much about inverse tangent, do we? So fundamental theorem of calculus. And we need to start asking ourselves questions. Tangent of what rotation gives an answer of 1? Well, tangent sine over cosine. Sine over cosine equaling 1 means sine and cosine are the same value. When are sine and cosine the same? Oh yeah, pi over 4. Right? Next one, inverse tangent to get 0. Well, let's see, tangent of what is 0? Well, sine divided by cosine has to be 0. Sine is the numerator. Um, what, so sine has to be 0. When are sine 0? Sine is 0 at 0. And so we end up with pi over 4. You are certainly expected to be able to get your way through this problem. Over the last few years especially, they've really enjoyed throwing inverse tangent problems at you and asking you to find values about them. So you definitely want to keep that unit circle fresh in your mind. Um, if it's not there yet, well, it's going to hurt you for a bit, but then once we get back from spring break, we're going to start doing uh, little trig quizzes every single class till you get it back. But it would have been nice if you had spent some time over the last six months getting that ready too. All right, three problems to go. Next one. 1 over x squared with crazy fractions. Who designed this problem? I don't like that at all. Um, okay, 1 over x squared. Natural log again? How exciting. Yeah, I've found that my students overuse or abuse natural log, where there are very few cases where natural log applies. And we actually already discussed how to do this problem, I think. Um, we said that instead of writing this as 1 over x squared dx, we should probably rewrite this as x to the negative second dx, and then do our antiderivative. Add 1 to the power, something to offset the 1 out front. And I heavily suggest you factor out the negative on this next step. I found when students don't factor out that negative that it messes up their fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so how does this work? Well, we have 1 over, sorry, 1 over 1 half minus 1 over 2 fifths. We do need to remember that 1 over a fraction just flips that fraction, gives us the reciprocal. So it's negative 2 over 1 minus 5 halves. We're going to just do a nice shortcut because I'm running out of space. We'll multiply by 2 over 2. And so it looks like we end up, ooh, see? Even I screwed that up with a negative. <laughs> Still need those in parentheses. 4 minus 5 is negative 1 half. But then an extra negative turns it into a positive 1 half. Whew. All righty. Second to last problem. x over x squared plus 1. A uh, few ways to do this problem. One way, very clever, is separating this out and saying, ooh, we're just going to split this fraction. So we keep the numerator the same over the denominators. This reduces to 1 over x. This is x. We can do the antiderivative of each piece and then substitute in our endpoints and come up with an answer, which would be super cool, except we need to remember our algebra rules. We're not allowed to split a fraction like that. You can only split a fraction where it's over something um, common. So if it's x squared plus 1 over x, then sure, you could say that that's x squared over x plus 1 over x. That's allowed. But the other way around, that is a no-go. So that step is not allowed. How do we get around it? Well, one thing I'd notice is that the denominator has a power that is 1 larger than the numerator. And so that's the case, it's going to be a u substitution. If that wasn't the case, if these were swapped, then either split the fraction or use long division to get you there. 
Okay, so let u equal to x squared plus one. That'll take care of the denominator. Uh, and then I think du is going to equal two x dx, which gives us one half du is x dx. Let's change those endpoints while we're at it. Good practice. U of two, mental math, two squared is four, four plus one is five. U of one, one squared is one, plus one is two. And so we now have our new antiderivative of, oof, let's see here, um, one over, we replaced x squared plus one with u in green. Our endpoints were two and five. And we did the du, or the x dx, yep, here's our x dx, we replaced that with one half du. Alrighty, not gonna change anything back. Uh, I am gonna factor out the one half, natural log absolute value of u, there's the natural log again. Um, and that's an unusual one, because you see this and you're like, oh, it's x squared, Mr. Grant just told us that's not natural log. I did say, with the exception of a case of u substitution. Sometimes that does end up. So we end up with 1 half by the natural log. Both of those are positive, so natural log of 5 minus the natural log of 2. And then just reminding us that when you have two logs subtracting, you can rewrite that as 5 halves. And if you wanted to go even further, the 1 half can come in to be a 1 half power, and you could even say that that's the square root of 5 halves. Where would I expect you to stop? Right here is fine. I have seen some multiple choice questions lately that have reduced to there. Over here is probably overkill. Last but not least. Go ahead and give this one a shot, and then we'll see how you did. Go. And you're back. Did you find anything wrong with it? This one's very subtle. I was pretty proud of myself. Um, we cannot take the antiderivative as is. We have a function with x multiplying by a function with x, but an easy way to get around that is just distribute. Right? We end up here. Hooray! Uh, we don't need the parentheses like this. I like to put the parentheses so we can remember that this is a height, right, times a base. We've covered that over the last few classes, and so parentheses can be important there, but a grader would read this just fine. They'd consider this as like the opening part of the integral. This is the closing. Everything in between is the thing you need to do the antiderivative of. But again, I like the parentheses, but there's nothing wrong without, with leaving them out per se. Antiderivative, correct, correct. We're doing well so far. Substitute in 3. 3 cubed is 27. Uh, 3 squared is 9, looks good, and then we substitute in 2, 2 cubed is 8, uh, 2 squared is 4, that looks good as well, and then we say the final answer is 32, where did 32 come from? Uh, 9 minus 8 is 1, 1 and 27 is 28, 28 plus 4 is 32, ha, nothing wrong with this one, no, I'm lying, there is something wrong, <laughs> um, did you find it? And I tried to give you a hint earlier by talking about parentheses up here, because although the parentheses aren't important there, they are certainly important here. And so what we're looking at, x cubed plus x squared from 2 to 3, we must, 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 must group this section in parentheses. And what are those parentheses I'm talking about? I'm talking about these guys. And actually, leaving those off would be fine. More importantly, I'm talking about these guys. Because what needs to apply to both of the inside values? Oh yeah, this negative needs to get distributed to both. So although I remembered the negative on the 8, I forgot to distribute it over here. Oh, I wrote an I'm like, wait, what's going on? This is a plus. I forgot to distribute it over here, and so I put a plus here when it does need to be a minus. And so if we did want to drop parentheses, it would be 27 plus 9 minus 8 minus 4. Definitely important. Now you can still do this out of order. You can still say this is 1. 1 minus 4 is negative 3. 27 minus 3 is 24. And get your answer. But watch those parentheses. Now someone might say, well wait, I know that this minus is supposed to go to both. So I was just going to do 8 plus 4, that's 12. 27 and 9, that's 36. And I was going to do 36 minus 12, which is 24. And I would have gotten the right answer, 24. Cool. You still would have lost the point. Because if you write this and say it equals 24, 
you are wrong. That does not equal 24. You are lying about order of operations. And the AP exam would certainly mark a point off for that. You do need to put in the parentheses. You must, you must, you must. As soon as you write a false statement with an equality sign, you will lose a point. So thank you for hanging out with me today. Hopefully you got some good use substitution and some uh, clever misconceptions out of the way. And we're going to come back tomorrow for our next application of the fundamental theorem. In fact, this is called, in my book, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2. And really, we're in hand in hand with the first part of the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. Some people even teach this next part first. Um, Khan Academy certainly does. There's nothing wrong with that. I like doing it second, though. And since this is my class, you play by my rules. Ha! Keep up the great work, and I will see you next class.